come together this morning to worship our mighty God. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we come here to worship you this day. We worship you because we know of your glory, Lord. You assure us that you are with us always. We feel your presence in this sanctuary today. Lord, touch each of us as you know we need to be touched, that we might draw closer to you in Christ's name, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Join me as we are called to worship. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul sings, and the Lord. My heart and my flesh. Even the sparrow finds a home and a swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. What joy for those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. What joy for those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to your kingdom. As they go through the valley of reading, it will become a place of for the Lord God is our sun and our shield. He gives us grace and glory. O Lord of hosts, what joy for those who trust in you. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and in love. Amen. Our hymn of praise this morning is number 118, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
truly, his kingdom truly is forever. Our ancestors saw or heard God's calling to develop a, a catechism that would give us guidance on what it is that we believe. Our responsive reading today comes from the Heidelberg Catechism, questions and answers number 12 through 19, as we read responsively. According to God's righteous judgment, we deserve punishment both now and in eternity. How then can we escape this punishment and return to God's favor? God requires that his justice be satisfied. Therefore, the claims of this justice must be made in full, either by ourselves or by another. Can we make this payment ourselves? Certainly not. Actually, Another creature, any at all, pay this debt for us? No, to begin with, uh, God will not punish any other creature for what a human is guilty of. Furthermore, no human creature can bear the weight of God's eternal death against his sins and deliverer of his What kind of mediator and deliverer should we look for then? Why must the mediator be a true and righteous human? God's justice demands that human nature, which has sinned, must pay for sin. But a sinful human could never pay for others. Why must the mediator also be true God, so that the mediator, by the power of his divinity, might bear the weight of God's wrath in his humanity, and earn for us and restore to us righteousness and life. Then who is this mediator, true God, and at the same time a true and righteous human? Our Lord Jesus Christ, who was given to us completely completely deliver us and make us right with God. How do you come to know this? The Holy Gospel tells me God began to renew the Gospel already in Paradise. Later God proclaimed it by the Holy Patriarchs and Prophets and foreshadowed it by the sacrifices and other ceremonies of the law. And finally God fulfilled it through his own beloved Son. And what a righteous and loving God we have that affirms our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the one to wipe away our sins. But we must confess our sins honestly before God for that to happen. The Gospel of Luke in chapter 18 relates Jesus' telling of a parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt, something Jesus would never do. Jesus said, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people and rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to the heaven. He was so ashamed of his sin, knowing that he was sinful by nature beating his breasts and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his home justified, recognizing his sin and confessing it uh, to God, as opposed to the other, the self-proclaimed righteous man. He exalted himself, but all will humble himself 
all who humble themselves will be exalted, Jesus says. And so let us humble ourselves before God, confessing our sins and repenting as we pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Before God, we have confessed our sins in silence, and now we ask, in your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will, and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Believe this good news. In Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. The word of God instructs us in the law of God, telling us, in the, as the letters Paul did in his letter to the Colossians, saying, since you have been raised up with Christ, you must look for the things that are above where Christ is, sitting at God's right hand. Let your thoughts be on things above where Christ is, not on the things that are on earth, because you have died, and now the life you have is hidden with Christ in God. But when Christ is revealed, and he is your life, you too will be revealed with him in glory. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
to hear the word of Holy Scripture, let us pray together for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the Scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us this day. Amen. The Scripture lessons today come from the book of the prophet Joel, the second chapter, verses 23 through 32, and from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8 and 16 through 18. Hear the word of the Lord. O children of Zion, be glad and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for, your, for you abundant rain, the early and the later rain as before. The threshing floor shall be full of grain, the vat shall overflow with wine and oil. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army, which I sent against you. You shall eat in plenty. Sorry, <laughs> I forgot to take the mask off. <laughs> You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I, the Lord, am your God, and there is no other. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Then afterward, I will pour out my spirit on, my, on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even in the male and female slaves in those days, I will pour out my spirit. 
I will show potents in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, and the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Timothy 2. As for me, I am ready being poured out as libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever, amen. Pray with me, please. O well, Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I would be probably correct in assuming, I guess. I was going to say willing to bet, but I don't bet, so I'll assume. How's that? <laughs> that um, You've all heard the term, make a, uh, turn, your, turn your mess into your message. Don't we all have messes in our life? And the key can be to turn those messes into a message. Or the expression, without a test, there is no testimony. Like so many words in the English language, there are various ways to interpret words, little words like test. The first te definition that comes to mind for me, especially when it comes to the prophets, is test in the sense of an examination of knowledge. I think I may have shared before that the one test that caused me the greatest difficulty when I was being examined as a preaching <coughs> elder was the test on the minor prophets. I did not do well. I had studied the wrong things, and that test did not turn out too well for me. But I was given a second chance to redeem myself. <laughs> I studied the minor prophets. I knew what I was talking about. And it served as a testimony for me in that here I am preaching on a minor prophet. That would be Joel. <laughs> I think I could pass that test now. So that's one sense of the word test. It caused me to study further, to increase my knowledge of God, and in so doing, to walk closer with God. There's another kind of test, the kinds of tests that Joel talks about in his book. He tells about the devastating effects of the locust infestation on the land of Israel and how the prophets encouraged the people to turn to God as they were being tested in this way. He describes the attack of the locusts. First, he recalls from history that God had sent a plague of locusts before as 
the people, God's people, were trying to escape from Egypt. Locusts were one of the plagues that God sent to help us help them to accomplish that exodus. So Joel says, we've been here before, folks, and now we're facing it again. This was about the fifth century before Christ is when Joel wrote. And so there was another plague of locusts that visited the land of Israel. Listen to these words from the first chapter of Joel describing the terrible conditions. This is before what Julie read for us. That was the second chapter. This is in the first chapter. Joel says, hear this, you leaders of the people. Listen, all who live in the land. In all your history, has anything like this happened before? Yes. Tell your children about it in the years to come and let your children tell their children. Pass the story down from generation to generation. Share your testimony, Joel says to the people. Chapter, verse four, after the cutting loose locusts finished eating the crops, the swarming locusts took what was left. After them came the hopping locusts and then the stripping locusts too. What kinds of locusts? I didn't know there were so many different kinds. All of those tests that befell them, just in the form of a locust. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you wine drinkers. All the grapes are ruined, and all your sweet wine is gone. A vast army of locusts has invaded my land, a terrible army too numerous to count. It has destroyed my grapevines and ruined my figs, stripping their bark and destroying it, leaving the branches white and bare. Weep like a bride dressed in black, mourning the death of her husband, for there is no grain or wine to offer at the temple of the Lord. So the priests are in mourning, the ministers of the Lord are weeping, the fields are ruined, the land is stripped bare, the grain is destroyed, the grapes have shriveled, and the olive oil is gone. Despair, all you farmers. Wail, all you vine growers. Weep, because the wheat and barley, all the crops of the field are ruined. Dress yourselves in burlap and weep. Wail, you who serve before the altar. Come, spend the night in burlap, you ministers of my God, for there is no grain or wine to offer at the temple of your God. Our food disappears before our very eyes. No joyful celebrations are held in the house of our God. Lord, help us. The fire has consumed the wilderness pastures and flames have burned up all the trees. Even the wild animals cry out to you because the streams have dried up and fire has consumed the pastures. This devastation has come to God's people again. How will they survive? Their ancestors had been tested in similar ways, as I said, and God was there for them. So these people of Israel know that history. They've heard testimony from their ancestors. Joel brings hope for the future by reminding them of that, of the victory that was there, theirs through God. Joel calls God's people to repentance, starting with the second chapter. In verse 12, he says, That is why the Lord says, Turn to me now while there is time. Give me your hearts. Come with fasting weeping and mourning. Don't tear your clothing in grief. Tear your hearts instead. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. God is eager to relent and not to punish. Gather all the people, the elders, the children, and even the babies. Let the priests who minister in the Lord's presence, stand and weep between the entry room to the table and the altar. 
the Lord will reply, Look, I am sending you grain and new wine and olive oil, enough to satisfy all your needs. Surely the Lord has done great things in the past. We'll do them now, and then we can trust that God will do them again in the future. Joel continues, Don't be afraid, O land. Be glad now and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Don't be afraid, you animals of the field, for the wilderness pastures will soon be green. The trees will again be filled with fruit. Fig trees and grapevines will be loaded down once more. A hope for the future after past devastation is what Joel is promising. These are the words that the Lord gave him to share with the people. He reminds us that God's people have been tested by trial before, have survived by the grace and mercy of God, and with God's infinite love, those people have a testimony now to share with future generations, just as their ancestors had a previous testimony to share with them. Paul shares a similar testimony with Timothy, in the set, this second and final letter that he wrote to his young partner in ministry. Paul says, I have fought the good fight. And Paul certainly had some battles to win, some tests to endure, and a lot of wisdom to gain before he became a disciple of Jesus Christ. Once Paul turned to the living God as his Lord and Savior, Paul was tested still over and over again. Initially, he was ostracized by the religious insider in the up-and-coming Christian movement. His sincerity and his intentions were doubted by those who knew him previously as a murderous Pharisee. Later, he was physically beaten for his beliefs, for speaking the word of God and Christ crucified. He was shipwrecked and jailed, tested to the limit of human endurance. Through the trials, the tests that Paul endured, his testimony of the risen Christ became the most important role in his life. At the end of Paul's journey on earth, he said to Timothy, as for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have remained faithful. Often difficult to do under such trials, such tests of our faith as Paul endured. And Paul lamented that no one came to his defense as he was tried and imprisoned. But Paul tells Timothy, the Lord stood by me and gave me strength so that through the message I might fully proclaim Christ crucified and Christ risen and everyone, Jews and Gentiles, might hear it. For that purpose, Paul was rescued from the lion's mouth. Not for his own sake, truly, but for the sake of the testimony that he would provide about our loving and merciful God. Paul faced the tests so he could share his testimony with Timothy, who would go on to share it with those who came after him. Just as Joel shared the testimony of his people to be shared from generation to generation. From Old Testament prophets to the New Testament disciples, we see God's work through the tests that they endured in order to provide the testimony that would come from it. From one generation to the next, Joel and Paul, Timothy, and we know here and now that we turn to God's holy word to learn 
from those before us. We also learn that it, the importance of the testimony passing from generation to generation. And we know that sometimes the cons constraints of human time, the era in which we live, causes barriers for of understanding from one generation to the next. Our tests and our testimonies won't be recorded in the words of Holy Scripture for all to read. Perhaps because of that, I believe we need to be even more conscious about sharing our testimony with those around us. Perhaps by using the resources that are provided to us in this day, the Word of God as a constant, the tests that we endure, the lessons we learn, the words of other believers that cause us to dig deeper and grow stronger in our faith, these are the tools that God gives us today. Last week we started a Bible study here taught by a man named Jonathan Evans. He's not Moses or Samuel or David. He's not Jeremiah or Joel or Micah. He's not Matthew or James or Paul or Timothy. But he's a modern day man sharing his testimony and encouraging us to share our testimony with each other. The description of the study, which is called Fighting Your Battles, says that in life's difficult moments, we find peace when we remember that the God we serve fights our battles alongside us. Even when we feel like we can't carry on, we can take heart knowing that in times of turmoil, God equips us to grow in our faith and draw closer to him. So in this day and age, we're studying God's word through an app on a TV with a virtual teacher. We don't have Joel standing here telling God's people directly what God is saying. But we have modern methods. And combined with traditional methods, of gathering together, albeit with a virtual teacher, we're growing our faith to strengthen our testimony about God's word and his work in our lives and in the lives of those around us. Bringing God's word to life in our modern culture can bring a different perspective, perhaps, and expanded meanings to the scripture and the lessons God has for us. For example, in this generation, one of those definitions of test that might well, not have occurred to Joel or to Paul, at least not to the extent that we use it in the modern language, is to test a product before it is proven to be before it is made available for public consumption. How often do we hear that something has been clinically tested? And then there's all kinds of testimonies from satisfied customers, patients, whatever, using that product. So that's a different kind of test. Sure, there were alchemists who tested silver and gold for their purity. So there were tests done, but not what we think of and hear repeatedly. Clinical testing is done to ensure that this product is safe. Not only safe, but effective. The definition for that kind of test is a procedure intended to establish the quality performance or reliability of something before it is taken into widespread use. Using that definition, we might look at our tests or trials 
as a measure of the quality, performance, or reliability of our testimony as Christians. Can we look at the tests as clinical trials in which God says, this person needs to be made more effective in forgiveness, and so that character trait needs to be made stronger by testing their ability to forgive. Patience needs to be built in this person, God says. So I will strengthen that person's perseverance through this test of patience. Perhaps God says, this person has been subjected to clinical testing that shows there is a lack of trust in my ability to handle their circumstance. I will build that trust through this battle and their testimony will be made stronger when this child of mine sees that I, their Lord and Savior, wants their joy to be complete. The good news is that God does not put us through human tests to determine our knowledge and to say, you pass, you fail. The tests we endure are not graded. Our answers are not judged as right and wrong. The tests that we endure, the battles that we fight in this life, are intended to strengthen us, to continually improve the end product, a living testimony filled with joy and praise for God our Father, Christ our Savior, and the Holy Spirit that fills us with the knowledge of our eternal life and goodness that life in Christ holds now in this eternity and in the infinite inter eternity of our future with God in Christ's name. We give thanks to our Lord and Savior and all glory now and forever as we build our testimony, Lord, our testimony that through you our battles are fought. With you, our victory is assured. Knowing you're by our side, we grow our testimony of all that you do for us each and every day. In Christ's holy name, amen. The psalmist said, Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before him. I invite you now to bring glory to the Lord in your gifts and offerings.
Oh Lord God, Master of the Universe, we pray that you take these gifts that we offer, multiply them, use them for the growth of this church at Inesquitha and for the growth of your church throughout the world, Lord. We give you thanks for letting us be a conduit for your great and glorious giving, your love and kindness for each of us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. As God's people, we're privileged to come together in prayer and we do that now. Lord, we come before you with the prayers of your people here, prayers that we have expressed before you, prayers for loved ones that are undergoing treatments and facing very difficult medical decisions, for those that care for them, who support them in their, their illness and in their trials. We pray, Lord, give them your strength. As each of us faces the tests that you put before us, tests that face us each day, large or small, we pray, Lord, for your peace and comfort in knowing that you are there with us Lord, we pray for our children, young and old. We pray for all of your children, Lord, for all of us gathered in these pews this morning and for those in this congregation that cannot be here for whatever the reason. Lord, we thank you that you connect us with them. Help us to visit the homebound, to place a phone call when you set on our hearts a call, a need to reach out to one of your children to give them support. Lord, we know that ultimately it is your love and support that we must trust and rely on. But help us, Lord, to provide your comfort in human physical presence when it's needed. Lord, help us to support in the many ways that we are able those in our community that are in need. Show us the way, Lord, to share our gifts, meager though they might be. We know, Lord, that you grant each of us gifts for the building up of your kingdom. Help us to be willing participants in that, Lord. Lord, we pray for all of those that we see visibly doing their share in service to this world world leaders, community leaders, first responders, teachers and educators of all sorts, Lord. Be with them and help them, Lord, to rely on you. Give them the faith and the knowledge of knowing that by turning to you, we have hope. We know that tests and trials befall each of us. And we know, Lord, that they are to build our strength, to assure us of your presence, to strengthen us, that we might give your testimony, the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, with all we encounter, give us the courage, Lord, to speak up when appropriate, to show by our actions that you are the light in our life. 
Help us to share your love and your kindness with all of those around us, Lord. We pray for all of those who are afflicted by addictions, by hunger, by homelessness, by the many diseases that afflict us. Lord, we know that you are present in all of those needs. Lord, there are needs that are so dear and close to our hearts that we don't speak them out loud. But we know, Lord, that through your Holy Spirit intervening on our behalf, we can come to you in the silence of our hearts and you hear our prayers. Lord, while we pray for ourselves and for others with supplication, Lord, we also pray with thanksgiving, with great joy in knowing that it is by your hand that we see the beauty of nature around us, especially at this time of year, Lord. It is so pronounced. The artistry of your work, the glory of your creation, your control of nature from the heat of summer to the cold of winter. We know, Lord, that we live in your creation. Help us to see joy in every single day. Help us to give thanks and praise to you, Lord, in the midst of our trials, knowing that they build strength in you. Lord, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who allows us to live in such freedom. Freedom to love you, Lord, knowing that Christ resurrected, provided for eternal life for us. We thank you and praise your name as we pray together in the words that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, in the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn today is number 69, Standing on the Promises of God. Please rise if you're able.
was a little different tune than I was used to from the title, but thank you all for... There is another version. <laughs> thank you, Lord, that we can stand on your promises. As we leave this worship today, receive this benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and as you go out into this world to love and serve the Lord. Amen.